Well, it's been less than 66 weeks since the last time, <laughs> so I guess that's a good sign. Um, there might be a few of you who have no earthly idea what I'm talking about, uh, which is absolutely okay. Um, it's a little joke uh, from my last message. Good morning, GCC. How's everybody doing this morning? Great. Great. Did y'all enjoy that worship? Man, golly. Got me all, all up in my feelings this morning. Um, I am very thankful uh, to have the opportunity to speak to you this morning. And uh, following up on the heels of an incredible six-week uh, series entitled Seize the Day that Pastor Tim shared with us. Uh, before I go any further, I, I want to ask you this. Did you enjoy the series? Yes. Man, I did. Uh, Courtney and I, my wife, we, we talked about it multiple times. And uh, just thinking back, just thinking back over the, over the past few weeks, we have experienced some powerful moments during that series. I mean, we, we learned some, some important uh, truths about God, we, we learned some important truths about fights, right? Um, it, it was just good. And I'm glad, I'm glad that, that you all enjoyed it because this morning I would like to dive in deep to the battle of David and Goliath. Are you ready? Yes. Man, I, y'all, are, y'all are better than me. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, Tim told us last week... Uh, that we would be finished with David and Goliath for at least a little while, right? And uh, I don't want to make a liar out of him. Plus, this, this, is what I, this is the thought I had. We have been in a battle for six weeks. Do you realize that? I, I, I mean, honestly, ever since Sunday, January 8th, we have been in the midst of a fight. We've been in a battle. Now, if we're being completely honest, it took Tim a month to get to the battle. But, I mean, still, you know what I mean? We were preparing. We were talking about the battle. And I I don't know about you, but I'm ready for some peace. I'm, I'm, I'm ready for things to just calm down a little. And Tim can get up here. And talk to you all day long about fights. And if you know him well, okay, I I, I know there's some people in here that know him well, then then you understand that. This morning, I'd like to talk to you about finding some peace and some rest. And if you know me well, then that makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. The title of the story uh, I want to share with you today is called Jesus Calms the Storm. Jesus Calms the Storm, and it is all about finding peace. Our story is found uh, three separate times throughout the Gospels in in the books of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, Today I will be reading from Luke 8, beginning with verse 22. Luke 8, verse 22. So if you have your Bibles, you want to go ahead and flip there. If not, you can follow along with us uh, on the screen. That's no problem. Jesus and his 12 disciples, along with a few others, are traveling, visiting the towns and the villages in the region of Galilee. Jesus garners attention and and large crowds. He pulls in large crowds wherever he goes at this point in his ministry. I I want you to understand uh, that he's no longer a well-kept secret. People have heard about the wisdom that he possesses when he teaches and the signs that he is performing. Thousands flock to hear him preach. They bring the sick and the afflicted with them so that he can miraculously heal them. We begin with verse 22. And it says, One day Jesus said to his disciples, Let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they got into a boat and started out. So one evening as Jesus and his disciples are making their way, Jesus turns to his guys and he says, Hey, this is the plan. Let's all get into a boat and let's cross over 
to the other side of the lake. Now you might think, which lake is Jesus referring to? Well, he's talking about the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee, which is mentioned numerous times uh, throughout the Gospels, was a well-known location for Jesus and his followers. A well-known spot for Jesus and his disciples. Jesus says, hey, boys, let's cross over to the other side of the lake. The disciples say, okay. And they all board a nearby boat to set sail. Now, curiosity got the best of me this week, I'll have to admit. I wanted to be able to truly visualize and see this with you guys. I wanted you to be able to see it with me, uh, this boat, what it might have looked like, okay, with Jesus and his disciples. So, I did a little research. And according to boats excavated from the Sea of Galilee dating back to around this time period, this boat could have been anywhere from 25 to 30 feet in length. Okay, you got to keep up with this right here. 25 to 30 feet in length, about seven, seven and a half feet wide, and about four feet deep. All right? Now, if you're like me, I need some visuals, right? To really see it, to really go there uh, with me this morning, I need a little visual. So this is what I did. I actually did the work. This, uh, the front of the stage right here, from column to column, is a little more than 30 feet wide. So imagine the length of the boat is almost the entire length of the stage, right? Does that help a little bit? We see it? Okay. Now it said it was seven and a half feet wide. Okay, seven and a half feet wide. Now everyone knows Brock Williams, our worship pastor. Okay, Brock is seven and a half feet tall. At least to me, he's, he, he is. Okay, so just imagine if Brock t took his guitar off and just laid down right here on the stage. Right? That's how wide the boat was. So we got as long as the stage, as wide as a Brock. Okay? <laughs> and uh, uh, I should say as wide as a Brock is tall. I guess I should say that. <clears throat> and it was from the very bottom, the center of the boat, to the highest point on either side, it was about four foot deep, so that's about how tall I am, okay? <laughs> See, that way Brock doesn't get mad at me. What's important, what's really important to know about this boat that Jesus and the disciples had boarded is that the professional, experienced fishermen among Jesus' disciples would have been able to maneuver a boat of this side with ease. You understand that? Th this would have been second nature to these guys. And not only that, they were on the Sea of Galilee, which was their home. This was their home. This was their lake. These were not unknown waters. This was, this was Lake Kiwi to them, right? And, and I want you to understand, they would have known every shallow point, okay? And we're talking about fishing now, so I can th say things like shallow, okay? They'd have known every shallow point, every honey hole, every stump in the pitch black of night. This would have been, should have been, easy sailing for these men. That's what's important to know. Now let's continue reading in verse 23. As they sailed across, Jesus settled down for a nap. But soon, a fierce storm came down on the lake. The boat was filling with water, and they were in, what's it say? Real danger. Real danger. Okay, let's pause because several things happen right here. As they set sail... And the boat gets out on the water, right? They really open her up. That's what we say. All of a sudden, Jesus goes, Hey, boys, I'm going to lay down, and I'm going to go to sleep. I, I'm going to take me a, a little nap right here. And, and you, might, you, know, you might be sitting there, and that might shock you a bit. You know what I mean? I, what, what do you mean he just laid down in the bottom of this wooden boat? I mean, did he have, did he have everything he needed to go to sleep? Did he have a, 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 a pillow? Did he have a blanket? Did he have a nightlight? Did he have everything, you know, that he needed to go to sleep? How could he just go to sleep with, with the disciples working and sailing this boat? I mean, on the water, you know, how did that work? Well, this is what I believe. I believe Jesus might have been exhausted. From traveling, or teaching, or healing. 
uh, night was quickly approaching, so maybe it just seemed fitting to go ahead and, and grab a little sleep while he thought he could. But somewhere, this is what we know, somewhere near the rear of the boat, we are told Jesus lays down with his head on a cushion that's found in the book of Mark, and he goes to sleep. He goes to sleep in the middle of this sail. And it might seem strange to you that he does that, as I said, but in my very limited experience, okay, my very limited experience on larger boats, such as the one that Jesus and his disciples were on, uh, when I was much younger, my uncle, Tom Grant, uh, we, were at, we were on vacation at Myrtle Beach, and he decided he wanted to take me deep sea fishing. Okay? I want to take you deep sea fishing. The only time I've ever been out on a larger boat, deep sea fishing. And I don't know, I can't exactly pinpoint if it was the sound of the crashing waves going up against the, the boat. That's not a good crashing wave sound, but you know what I'm saying. I don't know if it was the rock, you know, the gentle sway back and forth. I don't know if it was the Dramamine he made me take before we got on the boat with my Hardy's biscuit. I'm, I'm not sure exactly what it was, but as we got out into open water, we couldn't see land anymore. And we had the waves and we had the rock. And I can remember very vividly sitting straight up on a wooden bench just a few feet away from the railing of that boat with my Uncle Tom sitting beside me. And I can remember just quietly drifting to sleep. And every few moments, I would bump Uncle Tom, and it would wake me up, <laughs> and I'd go back to sleep. So I tell you that story to say, I kind of get it. I understand Jesus at this point in the story, and he is asleep in the back of the boat when a fierce storm comes down on the lake. That's what we're told, a fierce storm storm. The Bible says the boat was filling with water and the disciples felt that they were in real danger. Now, it seems as we read the story that this storm just came out of nowhere. This fierce storm, we are told, which was extremely common for the Sea of Galilee. I want you to understand that. The Sea of Galilee was actually 680 feet below sea level. And it was almost completely surrounded by hills and mountains. And what that did was it caused the wind to kind of tunnel in and blow down on the lake. And these, these strong winds would kind of create these fierce, rough storms out of nowhere. They would just pop up. Usually in the evening, but, it, but my research said especially at night. This particular storm was so bad that we were told the bottom of the boat was filling with water and they felt they were in real danger. The book of Mark says this. It says the disciples were terrified. That's the word it uses. The disciples were terrified. I, 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 want you to, I want you to imagine this with me just for a moment. Can you imagine how rough this storm must have been for this group of men to be terrified? I, 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 I'm, I'm being serious. Can you, can you imagine how high the waves must have been, how rough the sea, how rough the waters must have been for this professional group of experienced fishermen to be terrified on their own home lake? It must have been awful. I believe the disciples had exhausted all of their storm knowledge. I believe they tried every trick they had ever tried, had found success, or heard of. I, I, I believe uh, all their rough sea techniques uh, were, were exhausted, and they were humbly at the end of their skills. I imagine the humility it must have taken 
for this group of men to turn and look at one another and say, hey, I got nothing else. I mean, I got, I got nothing left. What are we going to do? What it must have taken for them to look at one another and say, boys, if, this, if, if, if we don't figure this out, we might not make it. We might not make it through this storm. I can see them frantic, exhausted, and fearfully looking at one another in defeat. So, they decide to try something new. They decide to invite someone into their storm. We pick up in verse 24, and it says, The disciples went and woke him up, him speaking of who? Jesus. The disciples went and woke him up, shouting, Master, Master, we're going to drown. When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and the raging waves. Suddenly, the storm stopped, and all was, what's the word? Calm. Suddenly, the, so the storm stopped, and all was was calm. Then he asked them, Where is your faith? The disciples were terrified and amazed. Who is this man? They asked each other. When he gives a command, even the wind and waves obey him. I can see, in my mind, I can see Peter quickly making his way, stumbling his way to the back of the boat, shouting at Jesus, Master, Master, if you don't, do you realize what's going on right now? If, 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 if something doesn't change, if you don't do something, we're not going to make it out of this storm. This could be the end for us. And I just imagine Jesus slowly standing up in the back of the boat. And when He does, He has water up to His knees from where the boat has been filling. I can see the wind howling and the waves crashing over the side of the boat. I hear the sail whipping back and forth and the rain hitting the water. I can see Jesus standing there as He rebukes the wind and the waves. And can't you just see the boat rock from that last crashing wave and then slowly it begins to steady. The wind immediately dies. The sail quiets and settles into position. The sound of rain hitting the water quickly fades, and as far as the disciples can see in either direction, the water looks like glass. It's calm. Jesus looks at his disciples and he asks a very cutting question, in my opinion. He looks at him and he says, where is your faith? Where is your faith? It says the disciples were both terrified and amazed in awe and fearful at the same time. Sure, they had seen Jesus heal disease and illness, they had heard Him speak and teach with such wisdom that they didn't really understand or comprehend. But to see Him stop the winds and the waves in their tracks to control something they felt was uncontrollable, I believe they didn't know what to think. I believe they were probably asking themselves, is there anything this man can't do? I 
I've come across this story many times prior to this past week. I mean, every time you, every time you read through the Gospels, you read it multiple times. And to be honest with you, I've always believed that it was a short and powerful story of how the disciples chose to invite Jesus into their storm. And when they did, He had the power to end it. Right? I feel like that's a, that's a good lesson. That's a good thought. I, I've, always, I've always imagined, you know, if we will just invite Jesus into whatever situation we have troubling us, whatever situation we have draining us, making us feel as though we might not make it out, if we will bring Jesus in to that storm, He has the power to end it. Jesus has the power to bring an end to our fiercest storms, I believe in an instant He can make all the difference. That's a valuable lesson. I still believe that lesson. However, this past week, man, God has been teaching me something different from this story. Uh, all week long, I felt He has been directing me to something new. I, I believe He went just a little bit deeper and He revealed something to me I believe that He wants you to see this morning. Is everyone still with me? Alright, this is it right here. Y'all thinking y'all might get out of here early. Think again. <clears throat> What if Jesus calming the storm wasn't the only lesson He wanted the disciples to see? What if it's not the only lesson that He wants you to see this morning? Before the disciples decided to call Jesus into their situation... What was Jesus doing? Sleeping. Jesus was sleeping. In the middle of the storm. Right? I, I want you to hear that because all week it's been tough for me to kind of wrap my head around that fact. Jesus was asleep. In the middle of the storm, the same fierce storm that the disciples were in. The one that we just described a moment ago. I mean, the wind, the waves, the 30-foot boat being tossed back and forth, water spilling over the sides, rain pouring down, disciples fighting for their lives. That's the storm. That's the storm they were all in, and Jesus was sound asleep the entire time. I have to believe that there's a reason for Jesus' actions during the storm. I have to believe that because all week I felt God pointing at the fact that Jesus was asleep. Jesus was asleep during the storm. Jesus was at peace while the disciples were panicking. I want you to hear this right here. He was calm while they were frantic. Jesus was resting while they were terrified. Do you see that? You see that in their story? Jesus was in the storm with them, and even though it may not seem like He was doing much, what if, what if God wanted us to see Jesus asleep during the storm so we could know rest is possible during the storm?
I want you to hear that. I want, I want to let it sink in. Rest is possible during the storm. Rest was possible during their storm. Therefore, it must be possible for us during our storms. What I mean is peace is possible for you during the worst days of life's circumstances. In the middle of your absolute darkest days, peace and rest are still possible. Are you hearing me? That's a big deal. We don't have to wait until the end. We don't have to wait until it's over. Rest is possible during the storm. Peace is possible during the storm. Why do we struggle to find peace during the worst of times? I believe we can see it from our story. Much like the disciples, uh, it could be that we are far too engaged in the wrong areas. We seem to over-focus on the worst parts of our situation, on the worst parts of the storm, or we fixate on trying to control the outcome ourselves. Does this sound familiar? We try to control pieces of our life that are not within our control. You say, Jake, what do you talk about? Well, I'm talking about we try to control how others react in situations. We, we try to control how others might be thinking or how they might be feeling. A lot of the times we find ourselves going as far to try to control what others may say or what they might do. We try to control the areas that are not in our control. We focus too much on the storm. Possibly we feel so far removed from peace, we feel so overwhelmed, in over our heads, or out of place, that finding peace isn't even on our radar. I want you to think about it. When you're in the thick, when you're in the worst of your fiercest storm, are you thinking about peace? Are you, are you thinking about trying to find peace within the storm? Or are you just fixated on, man, when this thing is over, when I get to the other side, when the storm calms, whew, then I'll be able to breathe. Then I can relax. Then the peace will finally come. Maybe it's a struggle because we feel as though things aren't changing quickly enough. Our situation isn't getting any easier no matter what we do. No matter how many answers to, to, to the numerous questions we have, we try to come up with. We can't see the storm calming. We can't see the situation getting better. And we feel as though there is no end in sight. I believe, I speak for myself, I know I've struggled to find peace in the midst of my fiercest storms. Maybe we feel that way because we've forgotten about the one who is in the boat with us. This is what I know. This is what I know for certain. Jesus has power and authority over everything. Everything. Every situation you may face. He was in charge of their storm. Even asleep on the boat, Jesus was in complete control. He had control over the wind and the waves. The disciples truly had no reason to panic because Jesus was with them and there was nothing in their storm outside of His control. This is what I know. Jesus was with the disciples and He is with us too. 
If you consider yourself a Christian this morning, a believer, follower, however you'd like to say it, but if you believe in Jesus and have asked Him into your life and have asked Him to forgive you of your sins, then He is with you always. That's what the Bible says. He is with you always. Which means... Through every storm you face, every difficult situation you endure, it could be work, it could be your marriage, it could be an addiction, it could be relationships or illnesses or family, no matter what storm you find yourself going through, I believe this, Jesus is with you and because of that, rest is possible during the storm. No matter what you're facing. He has absolute power. He is in control. You don't have to wait for Jesus to decide to calm it. You don't have to wait for the end of your storm to try to find peace. Rest is possible within the storm because Jesus is with us. If you keep your faith in Him, then He will give you peace that passes all understanding. That's what the Bible says. You might be sitting there this morning, and you might be thinking, okay, okay, Jake, I hear you, I hear you. Why? Why does this mean so much? Why, I mean, why does this mean so much to you? I'd like, to, I'd like to share with you why this matters so much to me this morning. In, in order to do that, um, I'm going to have to be a little real and vulnerable. That's what, uh, that's what we call it in student ministry here, which I'm perfectly okay with doing. Um, I'm also going to try and keep my emotions in check as best as I can. Many of you uh, know, and I'm sure many of you don't, uh, my daddy passed away May 21st of last year. Uh, after a long, long, hard, rough battle, fight, storm, whatever you want to call it, uh, with type 2 diabetes. Anyone that has ever walked alongside a loved one or a family member through, through any type of disease or illness, you know exactly the kind of storm I'm talking about. It's incredibly difficult. It's incredibly difficult to watch somebody that you love and care for as things begin to be taken away from them as they start to lose little pieces of themselves, as something like a storm, this fear really starts to change them. Man, it's difficult. And, and when I felt like God wanted me to share this with you uh, this morning, I was talking to Tim in his office, and I, and, and I said, man, I said, I, I, if I'm talking about storms, I, I mean, i got to talk about Daddy. And he said, yeah, I know. I just want to say this. I love my daddy very much. And I miss him every day. But I want to be completely honest with you guys. I want to be completely honest with you and myself and God when I tell you that I didn't look for peace during the storm. I didn't. The past four or five years leading up to May of last year, man, they were rough. At times it was tough, not only on, not only on him, not only on me, my, my mom, my sister, our entire family. It was, it was tough.
And if I'm being completely honest with you, since May of last year, I have been incredibly fortunate and blessed that I feel as though God has given me peace. I really do. And I thought that's what I would be up here telling you today, but God changed it on me because I I need to admit to you what I didn't do. I waited for the storm to be over before I searched for peace in it. I waited for it to be done. I waited for it to be calm to find my peace. And what God has shown me this week is I didn't have to wait. Peace could have come so much sooner for me. I have no idea where you are this morning. Some of you might be very similar to my, to my situation, you might be coming out of a fierce storm. Some of you might have one brewing on the horizon, but I know, I know there is someone listening this morning, right now, that is in the midst of your fiercest storm. You are in the middle of it. You are in the thick of it. And everything that we've talked about this morning, everything from our story that we've seen, man, it is you. You've been focusing too much on the storm. You've been trying to find answers, fix problems. You feel overwhelmed. You feel in over your head. You've forgotten who is in the boat with you. You've forgotten who is walking through the storm with you. And probably most importantly uh, of all, You don't believe that peace can be found until the storm is over and done with. And I'm here to tell you this morning that rest is possible during the storm. You can have peace right now. You don't have to wait. Jesus doesn't want you to wait. He doesn't want you to put off rest and peace that you could be experiencing with Him right now. I'll end with this. I encourage you. More than that, I I plea with you. Remember Remember who's in the boat with you. Keep your faith locked in on Him. Hand that situation, whatever it may be, over to Him. Believe, believe, believe that peace is possible for you right now. You don't have to wait. Let me pray for you this morning. Dear Heavenly Father God, I thank you so much for this time that we're able to spend together. God, I thank you for just laying this this message on my heart heavy this week, God. Lord, I know, I know without a shadow of a doubt that there are people listening right now, God, and they are in the middle of a storm. God, one that they feel, and it looks as though they will not be able to make it out unless something changes. God, they need to remember that you are there with them. They need to remember that rest and peace are possible. God, they need to remember that you are in ultimate control They need to keep their faith in You, keep their focus locked in on You. God, and if they will do that, I know and I believe that You will bring them peace in the middle of the storm. The peace and the rest that they need to continue going and moving forward with You. God, You'll bring it just when they need it. I believe that. God, help them to hand those situations and those storms over to you. 
Help them to invite you in, God, and give them peace and give them rest that maybe they didn't believe was possible. God, I thank you for how faithful you are to each one of us. God, we, don't, we do not deserve it. Lord, we love you. We ask you to be with us in everything we do. Help us to be more like you every day. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. You're dismissed.